This man is increasingly noted for his leadership. He exercises within the political party to which his energy, ambitions, and faith are devoted. Not yet 45, he was three years a Marine during World War II. He was twice elected to the House of Representatives in the National Congress, and he is presently serving the second of two six-year terms to which he has been elected as a member of the Senate of the United States. This man is an exciting, stimulating, and worthwhile American. The Congress convenes two days from now on Tuesday, January 7th. Our guest has flown here to share with us what the Congress will want to do, hopes to do, and must do in the complex year ahead. The guest is about to reveal his views and anxieties with your host and moderator, Harry P. Kane, on First Federal Presents. Hello. In hardly more than 40 hours, the second session of the 85th Congress will be convened and Senator George Smathers, who sits by my side, expects to answer to his name when the roll is called. We are fortunate that Senator Smathers has come to preview what ought to be one of the most significant, complicated, difficult, and important meetings of the Senate and the House of Representatives in the history of our republic. In our beginnings, Benjamin Franklin said to we the people about the Constitution, here is a republic if you can keep it, beginning on Tuesday next. George Smathers and some 500 others, Republicans and Democrats, out of a total population in this country of well more than 170 million people gather to seriously face up to that Franklin challenge which was laid down about 170 years ago. No person in the Congress is unimportant, but some, by virtue of their assignments and personal capacity, are more important and exercise more influence than do others. George Smathers of Florida is such a person. He is young, strong, intelligent. He is a member of the Senate Finance Committee, the Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee, the Select Committee on Small Business, and Chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. George Smathers is a leading American leader in our generation. Every one of us, regardless of our political persuasions, will be keenly interested in his responses. Just after this encouraging comment, which comes now from a local independent financial institution that has been keeping pace with every requirement of progress for a quarter of a century. Thank you, Senator Kane. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Ed Gegenschatz of the First Federal Savings and Loan Association of Miami. We've just paid our 49th consecutive semi-annual dividend on savings accounts, amounting to nearly $3 million, and making the total dividends paid by First Federal in 1957 more than $5,800,000. A new dividend period has already started, but it's not too late for you to get a full six months earnings on your savings next June 30th. Because you see, your savings received at First Federal, up to and including this Friday, January the 10th, will begin to earn dividends as of January the 1st. First Federal is an old established conservative financial institution. We're America's oldest savings and loan association, oldest federal savings and loan association, the largest in the South, with resources of over $200 million. Your savings in First Federal are protected by sound, conservative, experienced management, reserves of nearly $15 million, and of course, insurance of accounts. We have four offices in Miami to serve you, so that you may at any time transact your savings account business in person. And remember, when you keep your money in First Federal, it stays right here in South Florida to provide employment for our people, business for our merchants, and stability to our property values. Take advantage of this opportunity to get a full six months earnings on your savings next June 30th. Open your savings account or add to it on or before this Friday, January the 10th. Earn dividends from the first at our current rate of three and one half percent per year, compounded twice a year at America's oldest federal, the first Federal Savings and Loan Association of Miami. And remember, our branch offices on Coral Way in Little River 
and in North Miami are open all day tomorrow and every Monday until 8 o'clock in the evening. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And now, here is Senator Kane with his guest for this afternoon. Senator Smathers, before uh, uh, you take off for a very exciting period in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., you might wish to satisfy a lot of speculation about you. He's running rampant, uh, I think, all over Florida. It is said that you and Governor Collins have reached some sort of an understanding. Some people might even call it a deal. That at some uncertain time in the months ahead, you are likely to resign your Senate seat to run for the governorship of Florida and that Governor Collins will then aspire to take your place in the Senate of the United States. Do you care to comment on that, sir? Yes, sir, I would like to comment. But before doing so, may I first say to you, Senator Kane, how grateful I am for the warmth and the generosity of your introduction of me. I appreciate it very much. Uh, with respect to the rumors which have been going about, first, may I say, they are, of course, untrue. Governor Collins is not the kind of fellow who would enter into any sort of a deal, and certainly I'm not. Uh, I have been approached by a number of my friends, and I've been flattered by it, that they would consider me as a possible candidate for governor of the great state of Florida. That's the highest office that anybody in the state can hold. But, Harry, you know that uh, in this business of being in Congress that seniority counts for a lot. And you don't get seniority unless you stay there. And I've been there now 12 years, and I've begun to be, I think, reasonably effective for the people of Florida by virtue of the fact that I have been moving gradually in these 12 years up the seniority ladder. I don't believe that I would be rendering, therefore, any great service to the people of Florida by giving up that seniority at this time, uh, even to try to serve them as governor. So I think the thing for me to do and the best way that I can be of service is to continue, uh, if the people are willing and God willing, uh, continue my service in the United States Senate. I think I can do a more useful and constructive job there. George Smathers, you have sold me entirely that there is no deal between you and <laughs> Governor Cullen because neither one of you under any circumstances would make a deal with anybody and I buy uh, that. But what your plans are politically for the future beyond while you are presently serving in the United States Senate, uh, I, I, I just wouldn't take a, a guess. I think you put an awkward situation about as well as uh, possible. Now something very serious, George, about Washington, D.C. In the Miami Herald of this morning, and undoubtedly you saw it, there was a big black uh, banner headline. It read, uh, U.S. survival is at stake, and a mutual friend of yours and mine, Bob Considine, uh, uh, wrote the story. Uh, with that as a premise, uh, and out of your very large experience, what do you conceive to be the number one issue that will confront the Congress of the United States when it convenes for business on Tuesday of next week? Well, Harry, it's... Uh as it has been even during the seven years that you were there. Of course, it comes and goes, but once again, there must be great emphasis on this problem of preserving the peace. That's the biggest problem with which we're all confronted. The balanced budget, tax cuts, all that fades into complete insignificance compared to this matter of preserving peace, somehow managing to stay out of war. And I think that will be the major concern. In fact, I know that it will be the major concern of every member of Congress in this second session of the 85th Congress. Well, Senator Smathers, do I imply, imply from that that uh, your great ambition in concert with your fellows of both parties will be that of reappraising uh, America's strength, evaluating its weaknesses in an effort to get rid of those weaknesses right. so that we can uh, move uh, from a greater position of strength than has been true in the last several years? Well, I think that you and I and most everyone that I know believes that the best way to preserve the peace is, ironically enough, to be very strong. We are up against an opposition who, if given an opportunity to take advantage of us, we know they'll gladly do it. And so our peace depends in a great measure upon how strong we are. We must stay up with them, if not head of them. And it's recently been developed that uh, we're not ahead of them. As a matter of fact, if uh, we can believe what we hear, and I think we can, and the facts, I think, pretty well substantiate 
the conclusion that with respect to defense we are, or military power, we are today behind the Soviet Union. That being the case, we are in greater jeopardy than we have previously been, because heretofore we'd been ahead of them. Now, if we continue to let them remain ahead of us, where they believe they can knock us out in a matter of minutes or possibly hours or even a few days, why then we're in effect inviting them to take the step which in many ways some of them want to take. Because after all, I think we all agree and I think the communists still believe that their final and ultimate goal is world domination. That's what they see. And they must get rid of us in order to achieve it. So we must this year take every step that it's possible for us to take to see that our military posture is brought up equal to that of the Soviet Union. And I think that's the primary concern with which the Congress will be faced this year. Well, Senator Smathers, against this realistic outlook that you offer to us, very serious and sober-minded uh, citizens, I would like, if you do not mind, to ask you several pointed questions. You know, down through history, uh, American history anyway, we Americans have prided ourselves that we neither have nor will we ever uh, launch the first blow against an enemy intended or uh, actual. Now, in recent weeks, there have been some uh, uh, conversations uh, that the President of the United States uh, ought, for the first time in our American history, be given that extraordinary power that would permit and allow him as an individual to determine whether or not a foreign enemy was likely enough to launch an attack that it was in our selfish best interest to launch an attack before one was imposed upon us. Uh, this is a, a terribly difficult question even to contemplate, but it's a part of the generation in which we uh, live. To what extent uh, do you think uh, a president <coughs> should be clothed with that amount of extraordinary and awesome power? Uh, Harry, in view of the fact that today we know that they can send a guided missile, a long-range ballistic missile, and hit us, destroy most of our cities, uh, in the space of a few minutes, I think the time has come when we have to give to the President of the United States as the Chief Executive, of, Executive Officer of this country the power to determine in his judgment that the time has come when he must unleash the military power of the United States in a matter of self-defense. And I think a lot of people will, of course, not agree with this, but I think we can justify it just uh, under our present law. Uh, today, if uh, a man has been threatened by another man and they're walking down the street and uh, the man who has uh, stated the threat reaches back and maybe he's only going to pull out his handkerchief from his pocket, the person upon whom the threat has been made, he suddenly pulls out a gun and shoots, he pleads self-defense and the law books are full of cases where well, that's been justified, justified homicide and our law, our jurisprudence has said that man is not guilty of any crime. I think in this case, that knowing what the Soviet Union intends to do, if in the opinion of the President of the United States the time came when he believed that to, let, to lay back and let them strike us first was to destroy the United States of America, possibly ruin us forever, I think the only sensible thing for him to do would be to say the time has come to deliver the first blow. I think we should do that, yes. Well, Senator Smathers, talking in legal terms, is there any difference between this possibility of the president being required to exercise that power and the situation as existed in Korea when a former president, Mr. Truman, uh, sent our American troops uh, into Korea as an emergency matter without first applying to Congress for authority okay. so to do? He did that. Uh, the, the, the time factors have changed completely from what they used to be 15, 20 years ago. There is no time today to get together with the Congress and debate these matters and determine whether or not we should or should not go into a war. We know that if they start, it's a matter of survival. And knowing that it's a matter of survival, I think it's only in our own interest to give to the President of the United States authority when in his judgment, and certainly we know he would be responsible and prayerful over such a decision, when in his judgment he determines that the time has come to unleash our military power, then we must trust him to that extent, because it may mean, if we don't do that, that we in turn would be destroyed ourselves. 
George Smathers, many of us who live in Miami and Seattle, Washington, and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Tampa and elsewhere, uh, want in every way we can to cooperate with our federal establishment, but sometimes we seem to feel we are without adequate information on which to uh, reach a valid judgment. Now, in recent weeks, we have read many references to a so-called top-secret Gaither report which assumedly spells out the reasons why we are lagging behind the Soviets and states the reasons why America's future in terms of survival is actually at stake. Now, if the country is going to cooperate with whatever administration in Congress may at any time be in power, uh, do you or do you not think it in the public interest to have the substance of such reports made available to people so that they can cooperate better and sacrifice understandingly whenever that is a requirement of the day. I certainly do. I think one of the weaknesses of our system right now is that even the people's representatives, uh, their senators and their congressmen frequently are not permitted to see some of these matters which are kept from them by labeling them top secret. Actually, I think the people of this country are mature and experienced to the point where they understand what the facts of life are and they would be delighted to know what the situation actually is. In this case, the report, which I've seen nothing more than just a, a summation of it, certainly the Russians already know what's in that report because it's a report about them as compared to us. Now, we would not want to reveal to the Soviet Union, something which would endanger our national security, but we have learned in recent years that they know more about us almost than the general public here in the United States know, and certainly they know about themselves. And so I think that it would be a great thing uh, in, in getting the temper of the country, of the people of the country, uh, to where we're, they're willing to make the necessary sacrifices to lift our military posture to equal that of the Soviet Union. If they knew that they had to do it and it was based on some factual findings like the Gaither Report, I don't believe that anything is gained by concealing that type of information uh, from the people and certainly not from their representatives. Well, that is to say that insofar as you personally are responsible and can do anything about it, your encouragement will be in this next year to those in executive authority to take we the people into their confidence, however uh, drastic, difficult, and in fact frightening uh, are, are the facts of life. After all, it's the people that are concerned. They're concerned like the rest of us. Now, I'm sure that the people would not want to have something come out if they felt that in letting this information out, we were revealing something to the Soviet Union which they previously did not know. But there's most of this, as you well remember in your days in the Senate, most of this information, which is labeled tox, top secret, is information which the Soviet Union people, the government officials there, know very well. So the only concealment is concealing it from the American public. And that, of course, is where we make our mistake. This is a representative government. It's a government which gets its power from the people. They're the ones that are ultimately and finally most concerned. So they should have this information. Senator Smathers, it uh, seems to me as an average citizen that a nation can be hurt in many ways through extravagance, for example, as well as through a weak uh, military posture. Uh, some people think that uh, money can buy salvation out of any uh, emergency, however serious it is. I don't happen to share that view, but I state that for uh, background to this uh, question. In this last fiscal year, our budget amounted to about 72 billions of dollars, a, a, a terrific uh, figure. The president, in his wisdom, is about to recommend next week that the next uh, fiscal budget uh, uh, be increased two billions of dollars to a total of 74 uh, billions and will you reflect as you think proper on the advisability uh, of increasing that budget and what we may expect in return if we do for the additional expenditure of two billions of dollars well i think that it's the intention of the president and he's already so indicated that the increase in the budget which of course is the biggest budget that we've ever had in so-called peacetime. It's a budget which will actually run ahead of that budget which we had in, during the Korean War. But the increase is going to result, of course, in military expenditures in this effort to endeavor to catch up with the Soviet Union in the field of ballistic and guided missiles. I think 
personally, it's justified. As a matter of fact, there's some question as to whether or not it's a sufficient amount. You started off by saying money cannot do everything. I completely agree that money cannot do everything. But in this case, the only uh, area in which the Congress can operate is in the field of money. The president makes a request from us for a certain amount of money for the purposes of stepping up the guided missile program, then we're going to give it to him. As a matter of fact, there's some congressman, George Mahon from Texas, whom you remember. Well, I think Lyndon Johnson himself has uh, suggested that possibly a little more than two million should be expended. I'm one of those who believes that if we are to make an error in this field of appropriations, and particularly in the field of national security, it's better that we err on the side of too much rather than too little. It doesn't do us a bit of good to have a full pocketbook or even a full account in the first federal, we'll say, right. uh, if we have been struck uh, the day before by a guided missile, which destroys, of course, everything. So we must be certain that we not only are doing enough, we must be certain that we're doing all that is possibly anybody could conceive of as needed. Well, George, with your response as a frame of a reference, I wish you would react to this. The chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, on which you sit as a uh, senior member, the very distinguished Harry Flood Bird of uh, Virginia, is unalterably, as I understand it, opposed to increasing the uh, federal debt ceiling uh, beyond its present authorized uh, uh, ceiling of 275 billions of dollars. I can easily conceive that with a demand for more expenditures, you come to grips in a hard-headed fashion uh, with the rigidity of 275 billions as a ceiling. What is your view about this important matter? Well, Harry, as you know, you have a great affection for Senator Byrd, as do I. I Not only an affection, but a great respect for him. He's a wonderful man. I sit on his committee. He's a splendid chairman. But I do not agree with him with, on this matter of keeping the limit at 275 billions of dollars. I think that the requirements of modern life state that we must give the Secretary of the Treasury a little more room in this matter of financing the operations of the government. I do not like this raise in the debt limit, don't misunderstand me. I'm not out to spend money just to see it be spent, but I do think, and under the present circumstances and the great danger in which we find ourselves today, that we cannot let this uh, limit of $275 billion interfere with the operation of the government, and Secretary Anderson indicates that he cannot operate. He's not able to refinance the obligations of the government on this, all of them on this 90-day 90 term, 90 terms, and that he does need more elbow room, and I think that we should give it to him. Are you saying, Senator Smathers, that even though it requires uh, an increase in the debt uh, ceiling that we, the United States, can afford uh, the cost of survival. I'm well, saying that uh, we must afford the cost of survival. I, I don't think I need here to try to go into the fact that we have increased our national productivity, that we are right. actually a greater and richer country than we were 10 or 20, th certainly 30 years ago, and that re relatively speaking, our indebtedness has not increased uh, in proportion to our national income. I can leave all that aside and just merely sum it up by saying whatever needs to be done in order to meet the communist threat, we must do it in order to preserve our freedom and our way of life. And therefore, if it requires raising the debt ceiling, then let's raise the debt ceiling. Uh, Senator Smathers, this question may appear to be a contradiction, but perhaps uh, it isn't. You are a ranking member of the Senate uh, Finance Committee. I wish you would tell us, A, whether or not in your judgment a tax cut of some kind in 1958 is desirable, and or B, uh, is it likely? Well, and I think everybody will be fascinated uh, by whatever you care to say. Well, of course, uh, Harry, we would all like a tax cut. Nobody likes to spend money uh, any more than I and my particular family. We understand that. We'd like a tax cut. You know, many people don't think that senators or congressmen pay taxes, but they pay them just like everyone else. However, I don't believe a tax cut this year is likely. It's desirable and that we would like to have one. But I do believe that we will see some uh, inequities which now exist in the tax laws eliminated, but it will not involve great sums of money. For example, we have a situation where 
uh, teachers who go and, and are required by law to improve their diplomas every year, they're not permitted to deduct that as a business expense. Well, of course, that should be a deductible item. Well, we'll remedy that. There will be some consideration given to parents uh, permitting them to deduct the tuition which they pay to let their children uh, have their children go to schools. We're trying to, to raise the level of intelligence in this country. That will be given serious consideration, but it will not involve great sums of money. But I don't believe there will be a general across-the-board tax cut or any sizable tax cut for anyone, and I think we all understand as mature people why there will not be. If the Russians suddenly would agree with us to disarm, we had a foolproof disarmament agreement, yes, then we would have a tax cut and we should have a tax cut. But under present circumstances, it would be foolish, of course, for us in any way to let our guard down, and we cannot do that. Therefore, we must keep the guard up. We must continue to pay taxes in order to do it. Well, George Smathers, let us stay for a minute with this hands-up, guards-up business, which I thoroughly uh, uh, support, as do uh, most Americans. I have heard it said that the guided missile uh, is the ultimate weapon. If that be so, in just a word or so, can you reflect on how it came about that the USSR seemingly has gotten so far out in front of us in first discovering the way to do it and then building it, uh, the ultimate uh, weapon for what you and I believe is their intention to dominate the world. We're unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, very trustworthy people. We have a great tendency to take people at their word. They talk, the Soviet Union talks about peace out of one side of their mouth, but they whisper to the folks back home that we're getting ready to start a war or they're about to attack us. They have taken all their best brains, all their energy, all their money. They have directed it toward getting ahead of us in this matter of developing the ultimate weapon, which we call the long-range ballistic missile. Having put all their talents and all their money on that particular program, we, not having done that, they have moved out ahead of us. We hope, of course, now that we'll be able to catch up. George, we have about 30 seconds, but this is an important question against what you've just said. The president has made some positive proposals in support of federal aid to education. You are a specialized student in that field. To what extent are those proposals in keeping with your own view, and what is the likelihood of something concrete being done in this session of 1958? First, I think we're going to have a, a, a legislation this year which will further the program of education scholarships for scientific students. As you know, I have had a program of that nature for a number of years. I think mine is somewhat better than the president's, and I know that sounds presumptuous, but I don't mean for it to be, because mine can be accomplished without additional expenditure of money. We have this $600 million lying there from World War Number Two alien property, which is not being used. It should not be given back to the Germans or the Japanese. I know our time is up, but anyway, that money should be used for the purpose of bringing about scholarships for young men and women so that we can raise the level of intelligence in this country so that we can, in the field of technology, catch up with the Soviet Union. George Smathers, we're better informed because of your coming. We wish you well and hope you'll come again. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it immensely. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ed Gegenschatz again, speaking for all of us at First Federal to thank you for being with us this afternoon. And our thanks to Senator Smathers for being our guest on this program. Next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock, Senator Kane will have as his guest Senator Henry Jackson from the state of Washington. We hope you will join us then. Thank you again, and good afternoon. First Federal Presents has come to you live, direct from the studios of WCKT Channel 7 Miami. Produced and moderated by Harry P. Kane. Directed by Scott Bishop. Ed Gagan Schott, coordinator. This has been a public service presentation of the First Federal Savings and Loan Association of Miami, America's oldest federal.